Thanks for joining this episode of the number 86 lecture series, in which Professor Richard Epstein discusses property rules in the Roman law. Episode 5 includes topics such as how to properly determine restitution, the rules that govern landlord and tenant arrangements, short-term and long-term leases. This lecture is part of a series with Professor Epstein on how this ancient legal system can provide crucial insights about modern problems. Professor Epstein is one of the most prominent legal scholars of our day. He is the inaugural Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at NYU School of Law, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and Professor of Law Emeritus and a senior lecturer at the University of Chicago. As always, the Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. We still have several topics to cover on what the Romans can teach us about rules for private property. Let's start with something that is frequently difficult to resolve in a legal settlement, restitution. How is appropriate restitution determined? Does it vary depending on the contractual relationship involved? So in order to deal with restitution, what you really have to do is to start with the simplest case. And Gaius does not treat restitution, and Justinian does not treat restitution in its simplest form as being a property right relationship. They treat it as a, quote, quasi-contractual arrangement, which essentially gets it wrong. Uh, so to take the simplest text from Gaius, suppose it turns out that what you do is you owe somebody $100 to purchase some particular goods, and you give him a $500 bill, and he only gives you $300 in change. You walk out of the store, and then you realize that your $100 works, and you go back to the guy and said, you still owe me 100 bucks. And in a normal situation, he says, sorry, and he starts to give it to you. I kept the thing by way of mistake. And so the rules of restitution are not rules designed to essentially create new contracts. They're designed to make sure that there's going to be a discharge of the old contract. And if somebody by mistake withheld money from you, he cannot treat it as though it's a gift to him. Who's making gifts to merchants, right, when they forget the gift change? And so you have to pay the thing over. Now, why is this case extremely easy as a property rights case? It's because nothing has happened to the property from the time that the transaction started to the time that the refund has been given. Uh, so that $100 essentially could come out of the till. And you could be very particular and say, you know, you should have given me these 520s, and now you're giving me 250s. But that would have been a kind of discretion that he would have at the time of the original transaction. So nobody says that you have a specific right to particular dollar bills. What you do is you have a right to a particular sum of money, and they can discharge it in whatever way they want. And of course, that's the rule which is applied today everywhere. Uh, my wife has never heard of the rules of restitution, but she knows when she's been shortchanged and she hurries back, the guy on the other side of the transaction of a reputable merchant says, hey, I'm not entitled to that money. And so what happens is they both acknowledge the transaction and they do so in good natural law terms because they can't think of any reason why to deviate from it. And if, in fact, you have a rule that so matches the custom and the practice of the area, it's going to be enormously robust. There's nothing particularly Roman about it. It gets carried over into every modern legal system that's based on either the Roman or the common law position. Sometimes they call it quasi-contract because there's a relationship between the two of you. There's no formal agreement about the return of this money. So it's kind of half a contract, but it's part of contract. Now, if you treat this as a property relationship, then you have to tie it in to the last section of property relationships uh, that is developed in Gaius and Justinian. And this goes under the following three headings, excessio, confusio, and specificatio. And these are terms that are necessarily going to put sort of tears in the eyes of everybody who hears them. They're going to say, what is in the worth is this thing about? And so what you start with, with the simplest kind of example, and you can see the way in which the problem goes. Unlike the money situation that I just talked about, it turns out it's not easy to unravel the transaction to go back to the square because too much is done. So the first illustration that is given in Gaius is a very instructive one. It turns out that you own a plot of land, and by mistake, I build a valuable house on that particular land. And what happens is the house may be worth $1,000 to me and cost me 800 bucks, so it looks like a win. But it's not sure that it's worth $1,000 to the other guy. It may be worth only 700 or it could be worth $900. So we put aside for the moment the 
valuation questions, which become a really big issue later on down the road, to ask the situation what happened. And so the first thing we do is we start looking at the rules for the transfer of property. And if you're dealing with land, the only way in which that land could be transferred is through a formal conveyance by one party to another. Uh, so when somebody by mistake starts to build on land that I own, generally speaking, he's not going to be able to tell me, hey, this turns out to be my man, buzz off on this thing, even if it turns out he's prepared to pay compensation for the land that's taken. The basic rule in Roman law is that land has a hierarchical position over the various things that are put on the land by way of construction, the bricks and mortar. And so now it turns out I'm out of possession and he's in possession. And the way in which the system of accessio works is I sue him in order to recover the land on which he has built this particular improvement. And he says, you can't take it back from me because you will be unjustly enriched because when I'd made this particular improvement, I thought I was the owner in good faith of the land in question, and now you're gonna get something for nothing unless it turns out that you compensate. And so what happens is, the rule as it develops, is that compensation is now going to be required, and the man can resist my return of the property unless and until I pay him for the value, whatever that turns out to be of the property in question. Now, mind you, this is not a holdout right, he can't say you can't get it together unless we agree on some price that you're going to do this. What he can only do, as in the river case, is to specify a number which you can find not by negotiation, but by more or less inspection as to what it is. And so what you now do is you get yourself a forced exchange. And what the forced exchange is, this fellow is forced to give up the improvement on his property, that he made on my property rather, and I have to pay him for it. And the theory is, if you give him just compensation, then you can start to keep the thing. Well, then the question is, how do you determine the just compensation that's appropriate for this thing under these particular circumstances? And that is not a very easy thing to do. Recall the point that I made before, uh, that it may well be that the cost to the guy who builds is, in fact, going to be less than his perceived value, but normally real estate is kind of customized, and so his cost may be higher than my value or may be lower than my value. So you now have to figure out what these things are. And since this is not a voluntary transaction, you don't have a contractual figure to deal with, the contractual rule being if you own something that I want to buy, essentially you can set whatever price for it that you want, and if I don't like it, I can buy it from somebody else. But this is not a free market situation. This is a bilateral monopoly situation. So you have to do it. So essentially what they do is they develop rules. And what is the rule they develop? Well, if it turns out that the value to the owner of the property is less than the fair market value of the stuff that's on it, he pays that value so he's not unjustly enriched. If it turns out that the value he attaches is more than the cost of the other guy, uh, but less than the value he attaches to it, he pays the cost. So he pays the lower of cost to him, cost to the other guy, or value to him, the theory being that we skew the compensation system in order to give the natural advantage to the fellow who's entitled to keep the property in the first place. And you can start to see how when you start doing this kind of question, it sets the template of what's going to happen when the government wants to condemn land, where the basic rule is if it condemns private property for public use, it must pay just compensation for the system. And the reason why the Romans spent so much time working about these variations is they realize that this is the breakdown of the voluntary system that they have, where essentially people can set their own prices for things that they buy and sell, so they have to spend an inordinate amount of time to figuring out exactly how much they're going to have to pay under any given type of situation. Uh, so essentially what the rule is first, you have to figure out who it is that's entitled to keep the thing, and then you have to figure out how much money you have to pay to the outsider in order to restore this um, to the status quo ante. Now, this is the case with respect to real estate, but there are many other cases with which the same problem can arise. And it often turns out that you get rather different kinds of responses. Uh, so to give you the polar opposite kind of case that you start to have, 
Assume that what happens is I have this wonderful piece of bronze or this wonderful piece of stone. It's very, very high quality, but it's kind of a generic kind of property. And what happens is this stone gets mixed in with your property, and you now start to build on it as if it's your own. We're still dealing with the mistake case. So this is not a case of theft where you want to really stop somebody. It's a case of innocent conversion. And so now the guy basically, what he does is he works the piece of stone or the piece of wood, chips away lots of it, so there's actually less material there than there was before. And the guy comes back and he says, give me my stuff. And you look at this and you say, well, now, wait a second. Uh, it's quite clear that if you're trying to make a guess, the guy who creates this unique creation has a higher subjective value for it than some guy whose thing was done. Uh, so you essentially change the rule. Now you let the guy who has altered this thing keep the property, but what is his correlative duty? And you could put it in one of two forms. Uh, form number one is to say, okay, find a comparable piece of wood or a comparable piece of metal or a comparable piece of um, whatever it is, stone, and you give that to the other guy. So what he does is he gets a fungible that leaves him perfectly equivalent, right? And you get to keep all the value associated with the surplus. But again, it's a forced exchange, and it turns out you're trying to do so in a way which makes sure that the surplus goes to the fellow who put the distinctive labor into this. Or you can say, you know, what we do is we don't want to do stone. You have to pay for it. Now, what's the advantage of this? Well, if you're trying to do it, it's kind of a trade-off. If you say that you're using, you got to give a piece of stone or a piece of wood or a piece of steel, the, the, the two things may not be perfectly fungible. There may be some differences, at which point you're going to have to make a cash correction uh, with respect to the thing, and that's difficult. On the other hand, if you give money, there's the other problem which is at what time do you value the thing that is being taken? At the time the thing was stolen or at the time that the request was given? And it's kind of uncertain as to which things that you want to do under these circumstances. If it's a real big fluctuation, you may want to get the track the market value, but if there's small fluctuations, it not, might be worth it. So you then get this long discussion in the secondary literature about the way in which you deal with these particular cases associated with accession. And essentially what happens is you put the two things together and you have to answer both those questions. Now, the modern philosophers, when they talk about this, always take the wrong tack. What they do is they ask the question as to whether or not the identity of the thing has been preserved through the various transformations in question. And, you know, I'm not very good on the theory of identity and nor does it turn out as anybody else. So if you just avoid that question and ask where is the distinctive value with respect to this thing located, you then take the two questions in sequence and you first figure out who gets to keep the thing and then you figure out how much gets to be paid to the other side and this becomes the template for all forced exchanges that are done by the individuals or by the state. Well, now there are other kinds of transactions and the first of them is confusio. And it turns out that let's suppose I have some grain and you have some grain, and all of a sudden, by mistake, what happens is we put them into a common pool, and the question is, how do we sort them out? Ideally, I would like to teach each grain that I have back, and you would like to have each grain that you have back, but that's an impossibility. And so the rule is, if the two things are homogenous, what we do is we treat ourselves as co-owners of the thing, and as co-owners of the thing, what we then do is have a simple division. So you take you have 40% of the grain and I take 60% of my grain and nobody cares which grains are in which stack. And in fact, that's exactly what happens when many people store grain in silos. If the quality is uniform, when you go back to take your grain out, you take whatever grain comes first out of the spot and so forth. This cannot be done in the situation with the um, uh, statutes or with the land, because if you create partners, there's no easy way to divide these kinds of things. So what happens is, instead of a partnership or co-ownership, what you do is you have one person with the thing and the other person with a lien on it, and you figure out the various relationships between them. But you can do it with respect to these things so long as it turns out that they're uniform. If it turns out the mixture takes place and my stuff is of high quality and yours on low quality, and then what you have to do is you have to give the 60-40 division, perhaps, but you then have to make cash compensation in order to make sure that there's not an implicit transfer of wealth from one thing to another. And the third case that you have to worry about, and we'll end on this one, is known as specificatio. And so we take your grapes and my grapes and we 
put them together, and we make wine in one way or another. Or we take your metal and my metal and we put it together, and one of us makes a sculpture. So each of us have a physical input, which was not the case in the earlier situation that I gave with Excessio. And under these circumstances, uh, what's the appropriate rule for the division? And I think the answer is almost in every case. Um, if it turns out that the combined thing has greater value than it did before, figure out first the amount that people put in in terms of the physical inputs, and then if only one person supplied the labor, figure out that. Divide the non-labor part into half and give the guy full labor, and you get it. The Romans actually had quite a dumb rule on this situation, which they said that if you built the sculpture and you can melt it down again, then you just divided the metal which means that all the labor is going to be lost under these cases, and so it has never been followed. The correct rule then is to follow the older rule, which is if one guy is the maker of the sculpture, the other guy gets his pro rata share of the metal, and the other guy gets to keep the thing. Of course, the last thing you want to do is to destroy value uh, by knocking down these particular elements. And then in the other cases where it turns out it's an homogenous good, then you treat it like the Confusio case. So if there's a barrel of wine in there and you're a 60% owner and I'm a 40% owner, we divide it that way. So if you go through all of these rules, why is it that they're put in the possession rules? It's because these are cases in which you acquire property by ways that don't involve voluntary transfer. And the override, which I've yet to mention but is implicit in everything that I've said, is if somebody tries to take somebody's property in bad faith knowing it belongs to him, what we do is we give him nothing to the labor that he adds because we're trying to discourage the theft to begin with. And that distinction between good faith and bad faith converters um, is one that exists to this very day in virtually every legal system in the world. If you're a bad faith converter, you get nothing but the back of the hand and a criminal sanction. If you're a good faith guy, then we go through all of these various situations to answer our two questions in succession. And the rule of forced exchanges that were developed there carries over 100% to modern times because there's absolutely nothing that you can talk about our 20th century winemaking, which differentiated from second century winemaking. And the same thing is with building on somebody's house or with essentially uh, creating artwork with somebody else's stuff. The Romans spend more time on this question than they do on the law of sale in some of their early introductory texts. Why is that? It's not because this is more important, but because conceptually it's more difficult. And so what we then have to do is to move from these cases on to the later cases having to do with consensual transfers of various kinds of property, both in outright form and in terms of division. Assuming you acquire property in a consensual transfer, are you allowed to develop it in any way you want? Well, when we start looking at Roman law and stress the acquisition of land and of chattels and animals, uh, the key question, of course, is exactly what do you get by virtue of having taken possession? And the answer is pretty much anything that you can claim with respect to the particular asset. Well, with respect to land, we've already discussed this particular issue in the following sense by saying that you own it indefinitely on the one hand in the temporal dimension, and you also own it from the bowels of the earth to the top of the sky in the physical dimension. And so you've got this very large element. It turns out in many cases, people want to keep this thing in exactly this particular form. But there are many other cases in which it turns out that there are enormous gains from trade which come from the creation of divided interests or with respect to this large blob in any kind of asset. Now, exactly which kinds of assets are divided is a point that has to be instructive. And generally speaking, the best analysis starts with the following simple observation. It is always costly. Uh, to create arrangements which divide interests in property. And so therefore, you have to be able to get gains from that division, which exceed the cost of putting it uh, together. Well, what are the costs that you have to deal with? Well, the first situation is that you have to make sure that when you divide something between two parties, uh, they understand the boundary lines between them uh, so that the interests create neither gaps nor overlaps. And you also have to make sure that the state of the title is clear enough so that outsiders know whom they can deal with when it comes to the question of leasing, question of buying, the question of mortgaging a piece of property. And this has the following tendency. If you allowed perfect freedom of contract, people might create very complicated arrangements 
which would create a real tax on the system for enforcement and create a real knowledge problem with respect to third parties. Uh, so early legal systems are conscious of the fact that there's no rule for recordation, which could allow you to spread the title out on the paper. And so they tend to economize by limiting the kinds of interest that you can create in order to make sure that the gains from trade are not overwhelmed by the complexities that followed or once that division has taken place. And in this particular cause, then, you have to start to figure out what kinds of situations will moderate some degree of separation. And, and here there are the following kinds of arrangements, each of which I think should be talked about in order. Uh, the first of the kinds of arrangements that you have is basically what is called a family settlement, both in Roman law and in English law. And the most obvious kind of situation, you have this valuable asset that it's worth dividing, and it turns out that you're thinking of making an estate plan, which in the typical case would be protection for the widow or the widower, but usually the widow. And then after the widow has been protected, uh, to try to create ways in which the remainder of the property can go for the benefit of the children. And in English law, we call this a life estate. And you're allowed under English law to create as many of these things as you would want. But on Roman law, there was only one type of life estate that you could create, and that was called the usufruct, which quite literally means the use and the fruits from a particular piece of property. And it could only go to the person who was in possession of the land. You could not create a usufruct to take place after the first usufruct was occurred. And in addition to that, what also happens is that the usufruct was generally under Roman law regarded as a non-alienable estate. And what that meant is that the usufructuary, the guy who holds this interest, was not entitled to sell that particular interest or to give it away uh, to a third party. And this goes against the standard grain, which says that there's full alienation of land uh, so that the trading values can essentially produce wins for the buyer and wins for the seller. So why this particular exception under Roman law? And the best explanation about this is that this is not simply, if you're selling a usufructory interest, a trade-off between you, the seller, and you, the buyer. There's also the interest of the third party to consider to with that party who happens to have the so-called bare proprietary interest under Roman law, a rather inept name, or the remainder interest under Anglo-American law, which basically refers to the same situation. Can you explain more specifically what problems arise from third-party interests? And so the great fear that you have is if you substitute in somebody um, for the original party, he may be abusive with respect to the use of the land in question, and by essentially overusing it in one capacity or another, compromise the value of the bare proprietorship. And so in order to protect him from that particular situation, we have two sets of rules. The first set of rules is a transfer rule, which means essentially the only way that this third party can take an interest which is going to be valid is in fact to surrender the property to the landlord or the bare proprietor, who then issues a second use of fruit to the other fellow, and the appropriate cash payments can be made if such a desire to deal with this. Where you are dealing with situations where these are family settlements with spouses and children, Generally speaking, there's a relatively low priority with respect to the sale of the land in question to outsiders, uh, but there is a very difficult question that you have to have, which is exactly what kind of uses that you can make. And the law of usufruct essentially develops an enormous length, uh, a topology and a categorization and an analysis of what is going on. So the first point to note is the simple one. If in fact there is some overlap and in interest between parents and children, this problem will not typically be acute. Uh, but even under these good situations, there are lots of problems that could necessarily arise, and you have to figure out uh, what some of them are. Uh, so the first thing that you do is, if you're in these particular premises, uh, what can you do with the land? Uh, can you farm the land? And the answer is surely yes with that particular stuff, because the very notion of a usufruct is that the tenant in possession is entitled to use the land for occupation on the one hand, and to gather the fruits of the land for the other. But what kind of farming can you make? And here, the great problem that you always have to face is if the cultivation of the land is so intense 
it may well be that the usufructuary will do very well out of this, but the value of the land at the time of this person's death will be depleted because there's been excessive soil waste of one thing or another. Uh, so what you have to do is to try to find some way to balance off these two interests, and you start talking about reasonable husbandry, and the test that you would use in order to make this thing work is what sometimes is called a single owner test. If you did not have property that was divided between two persons, but was owned by simply one person, how intensive would the use would that person make, knowing that he gets the benefit from short-term intensive gains, but also bears the losses from long-term depreciation in the asset? And so when you start talking about the good tenant, the bonus fear, the good man under these circumstances, the kind of idealization that the Romans put together, which is still valid today, is you would just say of the tenant for life, the use of fructory, you can sort of do with the land what a good outright owner would do with the land because that meant that the amount of danger to the bare proprietorship is going to be controlled and it would be exactly the same as if you had this particular single owner. And so you have norms of that particular sort. Then in effect, suppose you're not talking about farming, but suppose you're now talking about structures. And the question that you now have to ask is exactly how do you treat these sorts of structures? And there is a conception that gets developed implicitly in Roman law, which carries over today, is that if you start to live in premises of one sort or another, as time goes on, they are going to be subject to what is usually called ordinary wear and tear. And what that means in effect is that if you use the place, it kind of wears out a little bit uh, because you can't expect tiles of fabrics to remain perfect in condition if, in fact, they're going to be sat on or walked on at every time. And then the tear is, from time to time, there'll be small routine injuries that will start to take place. And generally speaking, when you're dealing with the single owner, wear and tear is something that they normally put up with. But on the other hand, if what you do is engage in something which would be at the opposite pole, willful destruction of the property in question, then in effect, everybody's going to start to raise eyebrows because now what happens is the tenant gets all the benefit from this intensive destruction on the one hand, and the person who holds the proprietary interest suffers all of the harm. How do you construct laws that encourage good tenants but penalize bad ones? What sorts of property uses should be permissible or not? Uh, so what you then start to do is to develop other rules about what can happen with these premises. And, well, can you change the paint on the walls? The answer in this particular case turns out to be yes. Can you change the structure of the rooms? The answer to that question, generally speaking, is going to be no, on the grounds that the guy who has the back end should not have to put up with an odd or inconvenient arrangement uh, because the tenant in possession wants to have this. Now, is this an ideal situation? The answer to that question is no. And here is what the problem turns out to be, is when you say that somebody is a usufructory, it means that they have it for their life. But this is not the same thing as a lease where you know that the interest is going to last for three years, four years, or five years. You don't know whether this life, given the uncertainties of life in Roman law, is going to be a life which lasts for a year or two or 10 or for 20. And if, in fact, you're talking about making improvements and you knew for certain that somebody was going to live for 20 years and the particular improvement that was going to be created would exhaust its useful value in 15 years and the property would revert to its original state, you wouldn't care very much because it's not going to affect somebody who only takes possession of the property five years later. But if it turns out you put one of these improvements in place that you regard as an improvement and it's going to last for 15 years and you die after five years, uh, then for the next 10 years, the other fellow is going to be saddled with that improvement. What makes this extremely hard is when you're doing these kinds of calculations, market value is not the test of whether something is generally good or generally bad. Uh, what happens is whenever you start decorating a home or start changing walls, it's quite clear that market value and subjective value are at best only loosely aligned. And this means, in effect, that you may put something in which the tenant for life, the use of fructory, really enjoys, but something which the person in remainder, the bare proprietor, really finds entirely distasteful. And so what you do is you've got this jointness of interest in which there's no way in which you can make a change for the one person unless you necessarily make a change uh, with respect to the other person. And this becomes extremely difficult to adjudicate. And so if, in fact, you say that the bare proprietor's got the dominant interest, 
This would make sense if the usufructory was very short, but if you assume that the tenant for life, the usufructory, is going to be around for 30 or 40 years, the value of the interest on top of that, if you discount the present value, is in the order of 1 or 2% of the value of the total property. And so you get this odd situation that if you prevent structural improvements from taking place, uh, then what you're going to do is to say that the person who has 97% of the value in a particular piece of property is going to be powerless to shape or to change that property uh, to the work in which the way in which they want. And so the Roman law spends just an enormous amount of time asking what kinds of changes that you can make in structures and so forth. And then the next question they start to ask is sort of what kind of uses can you make if it turns out you're a usufructory? And so one question is, can you lease the premises out to somebody else? And if so, under what kind of term? And generally speaking, if you want to rent a room in the back of the house to a tenant on a bed and breakfast kind of an arrangement, it's not going to have much impact on things in the way in which they work. But if you decide that you would like to lease out for a long period of time the entire premises to a given person, that lease now starts to look more like an outright conveyance in the sense that this guy is going to take total control and what he does with the property is going to be extremely prejudicial, perhaps, uh, to the fellow in the remainder. And so what you do is you have to then distinguish between which kinds of leases you're going to allow and which kinds of leases that you're not going to allow in order to make sure that you prevent the extra burden from being placed on the reversioner under circumstances where there's nothing he can do in order to stop uh, the transaction. Uh, so you could say, well, the best way to handle it is often to do so by contract. Uh, but this turns out to be extremely difficult to do in these cases. And the reason is uh, the person who has the bad proprietorship, well, it may be one person and you know it at a given time, uh, but perhaps that person then dies and then the interest goes to the children and they have divided ownership of this thing. So now you have to negotiate with two or three or four people. And you know, this kind of situation can become extremely vexing. And so what happens is the basic rules here although subject to variation by agreement, tend to be extremely sticky and rigid all uh, because of the difficulties of renegotiation that start to take place. And indeed, when you do want to create more sophisticated arrangements than the bare bones standardized rules that happen, the way in which it's done today, and probably to a lesser extent was done in Roman time, is that the person who creates the interest at the time that it's created, uh, tries to tell you what the arrangement is going to be between the person who's in present potential and the person who turns out to be in future possession. And that could be either the original grantor, if the property essentially remains with him, but in some cases, what you do is you deduct, quote unquote, a usufruct from the property and then sell the rest of the property to a third party, and you can try to specify those arrangements. In modern English settlements, in which you have these divided properties, essentially what happens is, as people become more sophisticated, they realize that they have to tailor these things much more discreetly to particular cases on these questions having to do with alteration and occupation. What about tenants who do not only occupy the land, but help the owner to derive profit by extracting natural resources? Now, the third major category that comes up here, again, is one which continues to take place virtually every time. And that's the question about what are you supposed to do about mining minerals uh, from property that exists. And here, because the question is, when you take property out from a mine, that stuff is perpetually lost. That is, it just can't get it back again. So uh, the Romans started to have a system which kind of looks something like this, which is said that if a mine was already opened, you can continue to mine it. And the subtext usually was, at the level of intensity that would have been done previous to the time that you opened it, which is a good rule of thumb, but not a perfect rule of thumb, because if the minerals become more valuable, you'd like to increase the intensity of use, less value, they'd like to slow it down. But since you're not dealing with the sole owner who can make these things for his own account, but in dealing with somebody who has to worry about the value of the mine that's left after he's gone, uh, you have much less freedom in the way in which you can alter in response to these type of situations. And so what you then start to see is, again, the situation where uh, you can continue this stuff under an imperfect regime. Now, it also happens that sometimes you want to open up a new mine. And if you say to the usufructory uh, that you can't open up anything because it didn't exist before, it may well be that this mine would be extremely valued. This person may stay in property for 20 or 30 years, and you now immobilize the property for a very long period of time. 
So the question is, what do you do? And you can start saying you can open up the mine and act as a reasonable owner. It's interesting enough that when you start getting to more modern times, we start having very powerful solutions to problems for which the Romans did not have the mechanisms to deal with. So in the modern situation, what we do is we say, if you open a mine and take this stuff out, this thing is a wasting asset. Because at the beginning, you have 100 tons of stuff in the ground and 90, 80, 70, 60, and 50. And what you'd like to do is essentially is to make sure that the division is divided between the present tenant in possession and the remainderment in rough proportions to the duration of the issue. So in the modern situation, we tend to create trusts. And what we do with the trust is we take the proceeds of sale and we realize that some of this goes to the tenant for life, the use of fructory, and some of it goes to the bare proprietor. And so what we do is we put all this money into trust and then we identify an interest rate and we pay interest out to the tenant for life and preserve the principal for the remainder. If, as sometimes is the case, the tenant in possession lives for a very long time, you get a lot of annual payments, and so there's relatively little left for the remainderment. Uh, the value of the corpus will be exactly the same as it was before, but since you have to wait 30 years to get it, the value goes down. Whereas if you die very quickly, uh, the corpus comes into possession very quickly as well, and so it's worth more. Uh, so the way in which we try today to adjudicate the differences uh, between a tenant in possession on the one hand and a remainderman on the other hand is to create a trust, uh, to put the proceeds of sale into that particular trust, figure out an interest rate uh, so that we can have a smooth distribution as between the two parties. And the great advantage of doing that is if, in fact, you make sure that the distributional question who gets what when, is separated from the production question, then what you want the tenant for life to do under all cases is to adopt that strategy which maximizes the total revenue over the life of the particular project in question, knowing that the distributional issues will be handled by a separate set of rules. And today, the reason why we have trillions upon trillions of dollars in trust subject to these kinds of management rules is that we have very precise forms of financial accounting today as to what counts as interest, as to what counts as principal, what you do with stock dividends, and the more liquid your assets, that is, the more they look like money and can be infinitely partable, the more accurate kind of divisions that you can start to make. Uh, so what you what do when you look at the Roman stuff with respect to the use of fructory kind of arrangement is you come up with the conclusion. They absolutely understood what the nature of this particular problem was, that you have a single asset, and it turns out that whatever you do for the tenant for life, you're going to have to do for the remainderment, and their preferences may differ, and their time preferences may differ, and the consumption rates may differ. And so they're trying to figure out a way in which they get this balance. Uh, there may be cases at the margin which they get wrong, but for the most part, if you had only a one-shot operation at this and you looked at the 50 or 60 cases that the Romans talk about, you'd say they had an implicit understanding of what was going on. And in fact, if you understand formally what the problem is, you can see in modern times how the trust arrangement has managed to deal with it. The situations you've just described mostly deal with long-term relationships or arrangements. What about short-term commercial transactions, like a simple property lease? So once one worries about the transfers by way of use of fructory, these are strong property interests that are created in the measure which I've talked about. But it's also possible in some cases to have leases. And leases are generally regarded as commercial rather than family interests. Uh, so there's very little sentiment for having a situation in which the life of the party in possession is going to determine the respective value of the two parties involved. These are also cases in which it turns out that there's generally going to be a consideration moving from the party in possession, the tenant, uh, to the landlord, and there are going to be a bunch of services that the landlord may have to provide the tenant in terms of the upkeep and organization of the land. These can vary from one end to another. If you're turning about a lease of bare property, generally speaking, what the landlord does is gets a land rent and has nothing that he has to do whatsoever. But if at the opposite extreme, you have a landlord who has a complicated building and he leases portions of it out to various individuals, uh, the landlord typically is going to be more efficiently positioned uh, to provide services for the benefit of all these tenants by cleaning up the outside of the building, for example, and making sure that the hallways are clean and so that they will undertake these things in exchange for an increase in the rent. 
And the ratio of terms that you start to see in different leases is, of course, highly varied as you start to move from type of uses and type of an arrangement. And all of this is perfectly consistent with the Roman framework uh, when you do this. The question then is, what's the legal status between the tenant in possession on the one hand and the remainderment? Well, the key thing to understand about this is that the lease is not regarded as a transfer of property interest under the Roman law. It is regarded as a personal contract between the landlord on the one hand and the party who moves into possession on the other. And so what's the difference between talking about a real relationship, that is one which is involved with the transfer of land, and a personal relationship, which isn't? If everything goes well as between the two parties, which is the typical case, not much turns upon the description. The tenant stays in possession of the property, and the landlord continues to get the rent that is necessary, and the landlord provides whatever services start to take place. But if it turns out that there's a disagreement or a disruption, uh, then the difference between a personal relationship and a real relationship will start to matter. Uh, so in the Roman system, the first question is uh, that the landlord decides, in effect, that he'd like to retake possession of the property, even though the lease has more time to go. And generally speaking, under the Roman situation, the only remedy that was had by the tenant was damages for the early eviction equal by the fair market value of the lease typically, which is the extent to which the property is worth more than the rent that he had to take it um, for the full duration of the arrangement. Uh, but you did not get what is called specific performance, which would allow you to stay in the premises if in fact the landlord wanted to boot you out. And the second problem that one had had to do with third parties. If some person came in and dispossessed you from the land and threw you off, what happened is that the only remedy that was given for this particular situation was given to the landlord. Since the lease was a personal contract, the possession of the tenant was not possession in law. It was detention or use and so forth. The landlord then gets the whole type of situation, which leaves this tenant in a very precarious position. And so the question you really want to ask is, uh, do you want somebody to have only a personal relationship if he has these vulnerabilities, first to the landlord and then second to the outsiders. And as the history goes forward, what you start to see are two answers to this question. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And if it turns out that you think that the protection ought to be stronger, what you do is you call this thing a lease, and then you say it's a property interest. On the modern law, you're allowed to register that property interest, and that means that the landlord can be told to stay off until the termination of the lease, unless he has just cause under the lease to enter, and that the tenant in possession has a right to sue and recover the property from any third person who wants to take it from him. And this generally makes perfectly good sense if you have one tenant and one landlord. Things become a much more complicated, however, if it turns out that what you have what we call today a license type arrangement, where in effect it makes perfectly good sense to say that a tenant is going to be precarious. And so the kind of situation which captures this to the best is you have a movie theater and people come into the theater and they sit down in their respective seats. And the question is whether or not if the landlord tries to eject them from this situation, they're going to be able to stay. And most people say, wait a second, the landlord's going to eject you. It may be humiliating. We could certainly give you damages. You could watch the movie at some other theater at some other time. And so if you really say that this guy's got a property interest in this thing, it's going to make it awfully difficult to run the theory. And so we no longer call this a lease. We now call it a license. And a license is generally terminable at will at the instance of the landlord, where in some cases damages are going to be appropriate, and other cases it's not. It also means if you want to sell the movie theater, uh, none of the particular people who have bought tickets to future shows and so forth can block the particular sale. Uh, that transaction is extremely valuable. And again, the relatively small value of a ticket is going to usually take place by honoring the agreements. And even if you don't honor them, the tenant or the licensee, rather, under these circumstances, can sue for the value of the lost opportunity to see a show equal to the difference between the value of watching that show on the one hand and the amount that you pay for the ticket. You just mentioned that a lease and a license differ. Can you elaborate on that? How do these arrangements look in modern law? 
Uh, so modern law basically now divides this into two kinds of arrangements, strong protection for leases, weak protections for licensees, and basically the stronger, the more exclusive the interest of the tenant in a particular possession, the more powerful it goes. Now, the next variation that one has on this is also important in Roman law and in modern law, and it turns to the question of what it is that the particular tenant can do if they want to change the occupation or the possession of the land during the pendency of a lease. And there are, in modern law, two ways in which you can execute this. One of them is to try to create an assignment to third parties, which means as I'm in possession of this lease and the third party takes it over. And by and large, for the most part, people are very uneasy about the free assignment of leases for the same reason that they're very uneasy about the free assignment of the usufructory interest, which is the new person who comes in may make an intensity of use which is greater than that of the previous guy, thereby increasing the cost to the landlord. The new fellow may, in fact, be a bigger credit risk than the older fellow, so putting him into possession is going to be a very risky type thing. So given the fact that there's a retained interest, what is typically said is that the landlord can block the transaction. And the question then comes up both under Roman and modern law, can they block it for any reason, for any cause, at which point if the value of the property has gone up and the tenant wants to assign it, the landlord could hold them for some stuff? Or is this a case in which the landlord wants to keep the other guy out, not to extract part of the rent in a rising market, but to make sure that the premises are going to come back to him intact? And the modern compromise that you see in most places is that the landlord has to give consent, but it cannot be unreasonably withheld. And so the question one has to ask then is, what does the word reasonable mean in this particular context? Is it just a kind of a fake word that gives you no information whatsoever? It's hopelessly ad hoc. Or is it a term which has some kind of substance to it? And the answer, as is usual, any term that endures, like the word unreasonable, is going to endure because it actually has some useful function to serve, or otherwise people would have jettisoned it to begin with. And so typically the way in which you analyze it is you take the two risks in seriatim and ask the questions as follows. Is the particular tenant who's coming in a greater tech credit risk than the guy who's going out? And if he has a stronger balance sheet instead of a weakest balance sheet, you can say the answer is yes. If he has a weaker balance sheet, then sometimes the appropriate answer is to take a rent in advance or to ask the original tenant to remain on as a guarantor of the particular obligation so as to remove that risk. And then when you start looking at the uses to which the tenant wants to look at the property, you say, is it going to increase the wear and tear above and beyond it was on the earlier use? And so in the typical easy case, if one person is using this place as an office with relatively low intensity and somebody else wants to talk it into a bakery or to a factory of some sort where you're going to have heavy physical equipment coming in there, which will damage the floor, generally speaking, the landlord can can block that particular transfer. The tenant will come back and say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a security bond uh, to cover any kind of costs or damages. And I covenant that I will repair the premises at the time that I leave so as to leave you indifferent. So if you actually look at what's going on here, what the whole point of this reasonableness requirement is, is to say that the landlord can make sure that he's not going to be less worse off after the transfer on either the credit or the use dimensions, uh, but he's not allowed to block the transfer in order to get a rent increase. Is this an efficient solution? The answer is yes, uh, because the first two kinds of restrictions on credit risk on the one hand and on use risk on the others are real social losses. The holdup value is essentially just a wealth transfer from one party to another. And in fact, nobody in the ex ante position wants to put yourself in a place where you're going to face one of these games down the road because you know when you have those kinds of blockade situations, both parties lose. So essentially what happens is the word unreasonable is used to make sure that the blockade positions don't take place but allow for the protection of the legitimate interest. And this is the kind of thing which makes perfectly good sense. Now, there's another kind of an arrangement is that sometimes you don't want to do the whole thing. And the question is, what happens if somebody has a large premise and wants to sublet a bedroom or some portion of the business to somebody else? You use the word sublet in this particular case for a very precise reason. It means that there is no privity, no direct contractual arrangements between the subtenant on the one hand and the principal owner of the property on the other. Everything is mediated through the tenant in possession. Now, why is this essentially a good arrangement? Uh, because for one thing, if you're the guy at the top, 
the last thing you want to do is to have a partial assignment of property, which means now that you have to chase after two people instead of one people, A, for the rent, and B, for any danger with respect to the premises in question. By and large, if you multiply the number of individuals who owe an obligation to a given party, that symbol division is in fact an externality which makes things more difficult than otherwise. So you don't want to be involved in it at all. And if you keep the original tenant on the lease for the whole property, for the whole rent, for the whole use, essentially the burdens that are going to be created are going to be reduced. And then from the point of view of the actual tenant in possession, Generally speaking, they want to keep control over the whole tent property. And if they assign this one room out so that they don't have their landlord power, they're going to be reduced in their capacity to control what their tenant does. So from the point of view of both parties, these subtenancies for portions of the land make much more sense uh, than it does with respect to an assignment for the whole. And if you think about this, you can create endless layers. You can have leases, subleases, subleases, or for subleases, and so forth. There comes a point when the chains become sufficiently large that nobody benefits from them, but it's very common to see three, sometimes even four levels, and you're doing it in exactly this form for exactly this kind of reason. You want to protect the landlord from a multiplicity of risks, and you want to make sure that the tenant keeps control over the present, so the tenant is happy to assume all the financial risk <laughs> because he's going to be in a much better position to either evict his subtenant or to take a security deposit in advance uh, to control the situation. Now, the overall lesson that you start to draw from this, <coughs> which is extremely important, is that the kinds of considerations that you're talking about here are as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago. It may be that we have different ways of wrecking premises and making noise than we did then, but the basic economic dynamics start to take place. So the Roman relationships and the variations on them have a tremendous staying power. And if you understand the way they worked in Roman law, you'll understand how they work in common law as well. Thank you for listening to this episode of the number 86 lecture series. The spirit of debate of our founding fathers animates all of the number 86 content. Encouraging discussion and critical reflection relative to how each subject is widely understood and taught in law schools and among law students. Subscribe to the number 86 lecture series on your favorite podcast platform to have each episode delivered the moment it's released. You can also go to fedsoc.org forward slash number 86 for lectures and videos on federalism, separation of powers, the judiciary, and more. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash N-O-8-6. Thanks for listening. See you in class.